To start, though, I would like to begin by respectfully acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which this event is taking place and honor, and honor elders both past and present. I want to thank the University of Queensland Women in Engineering Alumni Council and thank you for all for being here this morning. It has been fantastic to hear the, you know, the voice, the discussion. You, know, you could tell there was a real buzz in the room and it's really exciting to be here today. I, as mentioned, I'm Wendy King. I'm president for Conica Flips for East Australia. Just to quickly explain, we're split the country basically in half. So I've got a cu counterpart on the west side and then I'm responsible for our operations on the east side. Now what's new is in the sense that I agreed to do this talk, I've actually just accepted another role with ConocoPhillips. And so I'm going to be moving to take over and be the vice president for the Great Plains Business Unit, which is basically the western half of the United States, effective the end of March, so the 1st of April. And so I'm in a real, this is a fantastic opportunity for me both professionally um, and also very excited on a personal level, though my husband and my son will be staying in Brisbane for a period of time. So this is one of those life transitions that I'm about to happen in my career. I'm very excited about the professional opportunity, but recognize it's coming with some compromises I'm making on my personal side as a result of the choice. I'm also, I'm gonna quickly mention that I'm a huge fan of engineering. I'm an engineer, my husband's an engineer, my father-in-law who happens to be here today is also an engineer. My two children are, one of my, my daughter is actually moved to MIT and studying engineering right now. And my son is in year 12 and is absolutely going to be an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> the apple did not fall from the, fall from the tree bar on that one. He is absolutely an engineer at heart. So I'm a fan of the profession. I think we create tremendous value across multiple industries as a profession. So I'm, I'm very, very supportive of, of the profession as a whole. Now, one other thing that I feel very, that personally I wanted to add today, um, part of what I'm going to talk about, one of my critical successes, is actually my partner. My spouse has been absolutely amazing through this career that I've had, and his parents are here today, and his father has always been a great role model to me because of the engineering, but probably more importantly is his mother, because his mother has left in him an impression that he actually is, he has to share the load with me. It's never expected that it's Wendy's responsibility to do everything with our children or our lifestyle. So I give full credit to the both of them for how they've raised their son and made him such a fabulous husband to me. So that's one of my key success factors, sorry. <laughs> but it has been fantastic. <laughs> he is a... a they, <laughs> So I started my career as a, um, a petroleum engineer working in Houston, Texas. Um, I've, I've had 29 years now in the industry. I, uh, I, let me just quickly introduce ConocoPhillips. I do actually like to show a few pictures um, because I, I, engineers, you love to have a look, look, look at a few slides. Um, we, as a company, you may not have heard of ConocoPhillips. Um, we operate in 16 countries. We have 11,000 employees globally. We produce, explore, Crude, for crude oil, natural gas, and liquefied natural gas. And here in Australia, we operate two world-class liquefied natural gas facilities. And I'm responsible for the operation of the facility that's in Gladstone or Curtis Island. And so those, in fact, that, that plant just came on stream in late 2015, and I've been fortunate enough to have a great team that supports me in our operations of that facility. As far as zooming in a little bit more on Australia, I just wanted to highlight the Darwin LNG facility. Is one of the it was the first LNG facility in the Northern Territory and the second in Australia. So it's been operating for quite a long period of time. It has averaged one safe cargo a week since 2006. So a, a long established operation there. In Queensland, ConocoPhillips is a shareholder in the Australia Pacific LNG project. So we have a 37.5% interest and we're the operator of that facility on half of the joint venture. And for those, I know there's a lot of people in the room from Origin. Origin's a 37.5% shareholder and responsible for the upstream operations. And we've had a very good rec working relationship with Origin over the years in the development of that JV. Should also mention Sinopec is another shareholder. Sinopec is one of the key buyers out of the project as well. So it's a very good JV and a very good operation that we've had. Just for context, that plant is moving one cargo every three days right now the Curtis Island facility. So every three days I have a ship arriving, loading and taking this to long, firm long-term customers um, across the globe. So, so just a little bit explain of what we do. We have so Origin on behalf of the joint venture. They're responsible for the extraction of the natural grass around the, the, the towns of Roma, Chinchilla and Miles. 
It's transported by a big pipeline. Some of it's transported to a big pipeline to the LNG facility of where we then convert it to LNG. Now, a lot of the audiences I speak to, they actually don't understand what that means converting it to LNG, but effectively what we're doing is taking gas that would be in a gaseous stage now and converting that to a liquid stage by having it drop in its temperature to minus 161 degrees Celsius. So a lot of energy is used to convert it. It shrinks it by a factor of about 600. And then we put it, that liquid onto a tanker so we can ship it across to places where it can then be regasified. The, the process itself is actually very well established. ConocoPhillips developed the technology. When I was in Alaska, the plant that we had in Alaska ran 42 years of uninterrupted cargoes serving customers using that technology. So it's a very well proven technology. I should mention our gas is predominantly sold to customers, the LNG, to in China and Japan. But I want to also emphasize that APLNG is one of the largest providers of natural gas to the East Coast as well. And I think that gets lost a lot in the discussions right now, but there's both a, a very long-term commitment to both domestic customers and those LNG customers, and we honor our firm customers very much. I do think it's important to recognize, I think this group will know, natural gas is actually playing a very critical role right now in this transition that we're having. And I think that um, I think that's message gets lost a little bit because of the fact that exports model, sometimes people say, why is the gas being exported? But the reality is those countries that are bringing in that natural gas, they're on their transition too. And I'm looking at this on a world picture and saying, how can natural gas on a world picture continue to help provide that transition to a cleaner economy that people are seeing? This is the picture of the facility in Curtis Island. I try to remind people, a lot of people think Curtis Island actually might be connected by a road, it's not. It's actually, we have to get all of our goods and services out to the facility either by barge or by ferry. Occasionally we'll use helicopters if we're in a scenario where we need to use a helicopter, but it does actually require the logistics effort of getting goods and services to an island. We've got a great team that, that operate the facility day in, day out, and also have a team in the office in Gladstone as well. So we're clearly aware of what's happening in the community and engaged with the community. All of our employees are based in Gladstone. Now, I'll tell you a little bit about my story. I was born in rural Nebraska. Now, Nebraska is about the exact center of the United States. It's pretty much one of those states that people say they know nothing about, okay? That it's, there's nothing discriminatory that, that people say is exciting about Nebraska, except it used to be really good at American football. My hometown was 300 people. So in my school, most everybody was related to me. <laughs> Hence the reason why my husband was from the London area. I had to actually go a long way away to meet somebody that wasn't related to me. No, it was, I'm from a very, very small town. Nobody in my family had been to university. But I was good at math and science. And I had a teacher that said, I really think you ought to consider engineering. So it was a real stretch for me to be able to say, hey, I'm going to go away to a different state to go to university and study engineering. All my family is still in the agricultural type industries back in Nebraska, and, and now one of them's moved to Kansas, got really out there. Now, we'll say that um, I was able to afford university because I played sport. And sport helped to, be, to uh, I had some scholarships to play um, volleyball, basketball, and actually played softball as well. So I played a lot of sports in university. But the combination of sports and academic scholarships are what allowed me to get through university. But I was one of those people that the day I graduated, I wanted to get a job right away because I was facing pretty significant debt and I actually needed money. <laughs> so I really, I felt very fortunate that I had that ability to get to university, be able to pay for it myself, and be able to get a job right away. Part of why I chose petroleum engineering actually was for the wrong reason. I chose it because it had the highest starting salary of any of the engineering disciplines in the United <laughs> States. As I got into the degree, I realized I absolutely loved it. Because from my side, it's the, a classic example of taking all this applied math and science, but applying it to something under the ground. And so I loved my geology classes. I loved being able to, to have that combination of really working with my data, like we're trying to use seismic to image what's happening below the ground, drilling wells, and yet being able to apply how do we think wells and the technology we're using in that well development is just fantastic. So I feel very fortunate that for a wrong reason, I ended up picking a profession that I absolutely love and have enjoyed for almost a 30 year career now. Thinking back though on my times in the 80s and in the early 90s um, when I began my career in oil and gas, I would like to say the numbers have changed, but I'm not completely convinced they have changed that much. There's not a lot of women in my industry. 
And I remember in the university there was about 90% men and about 10% female. And um, in my particular discipline, I think there were more in chemical engineering, um, but mostly in petroleum engineering it was heavily, heavily a male dominated field. And there was a lady by the name of Dr. Ramona Graves. Dr. Ramona Graves, I think, was the third woman in the world to get a PhD in petroleum engineering, and she also happened to be from Nebraska. And she put me at ease about my choices and kept me as a, I mean, a mentor. In fact, her and I keep in touch even to this day. Um, she was a fabulous professor. She taught mud lab, by the way. Um, if you know what mud lab is, that's how we figure out how to use what, when we drill wells, what's the right way to make mud to drill our wells that we drill. I always thought it fantastic that I had a teacher from Nebraska, a professor from Nebraska, wearing her cowboy boots and blue jeans, teaching mud lab to a lot of men. And I thought that was such a fantastic role model in my early career. Ramona ended up becoming the head of the department at uh, Colorado School of Mines and Petroleum Engineering. So Ramona has been a solid contributor to our industry and to many, many students for many years. I remember in my early career, my first offshore survival training course, I had to do it. Um, anybody had to go through the offshore survival training courses? They're not a pleasant experience, by the way, um, especially from a girl from Nebraska who didn't grow up around a lot of water. Uh, my first one was um, in, for offshore Gulf of Mexico. And I'm sure there was some instructor in the back of the room that said, I'm going to pair this guy that's three times the size of her, that's petrified of water with her, and we're going to flip him over upside down in a helicopter together and see who gets out first. And I can assure you, there was no ladies first with this gentleman. He was, he was absolutely, the minute that helicopter flipped over, it was like, whoever can get out the window first is getting out first. And I was sitting in a back corner as he's, led, you know, he's pushing against me to try to get out of the helicopter. Thought to myself, and then I also had to pull him out into the raft. Um, so it was a real test of my, you know, I, and you knew, you knew you were being tested when you were doing that. My next offshore survival training course was in the North Sea. Now, the North Sea one takes it to a new notch because they put you in a really cold water, put you in a survival training suit, do the helicopter flip over with a lot more of you in the helicopter, and then you also have to climb up a rope. Now, for a lot of women, that is a really big issue. You know, I was pretty strong coming out of college. Eight to 10 years into my profession, my upper body strength probably wasn't needed. And I know many of my women, female colleagues actually had to work out to get their upper body strength to be able to pass that class so they could actually get to go work on the rigs in the North Sea. Now I understood why they needed it. Because there is chances a helicopter could go down and you may actually have to get yourself out by climbing a rope. But it just presented a challenge to me that highlighted there are differences in how we address our careers. And, and frankly, I know that one of the, the first female OIM ever in the North Sea had to take that class four times before she passed it. I've had a fortune in my career. I've, been work, I've worked on drilling rigs in 3,000 feet of water west of Shetlands. I've worked on many onshore oil and gas fields, and I have loved all the places I've lived. Once again, I'm going to give my mother-in-law full credit here. She gave me some early advice that said, every place you go in your life, live it like you're going to live there forever. And that has been the most fantastic advice, because as I've moved around the globe, I've been able to say, don't regret, or don't make that community or that, that something that it's not. You know, I remember when I worked in Nigeria, a lot of people would say, why, how could you enjoy Nigeria? You gotta love West Africa for what it is, not for what it's not. And that's such, because I can tell you, there's some challenges there. I don't think I've ever not traveled in West Africa without losing my luggage. So you get, you know, <laughs> with our last trip to East Africa, we, had a, we were without a week without our luggage. But those are simple things that you can actually live through. Just welcome the places that you go in your career. Alaska, though, I was in Alaska for nine years, and I was in Alaska, or sorry, in Australia now, I've been here for eight years. And these two places have touched my life more than ever because that's where I've raised my two children. They were both born in Houston, Texas, but they don't remember Houston, Texas at all. And they spent their early nine years in Alaska and then eight years now here. Now, I think I may have lost one of mine, my son, I was absolutely convinced he's a Queenslander through and through. He loves his rugby. He wants to go to university here. Um, he, I think, will stay here. And I think there's a really good possibility my daughter will come back here. And so I have really developed a, a strong um, pride of what Australia and the opportunities Queensland's presented to me and my children. And I'm proud that they actually want to be here. Now, I've had a successful career. And I, people have asked me, what are those things that um, um, have been some of my keys to success on it? And there's a couple, these are my words of advice. And I can tell you that don't try to ever put yourself in, my, what's worked for me may not work for you. 
But if, if I can give you a few ideas that might help you as you're working through your careers, both, um, I'm hoping both men and women are listening to these because I think they're important that you're, you're seeing different perspectives on it. I think one of our biggest ones is we don't ask for help. Okay, I, I, a lot of people I know say it's my job to do it all. I'm going to be superwoman, super dad, super mom, whatever it might be, and you try to do it all yourself. Maybe it's because I've moved a lot and I've not had family around me. I'm not, pro I'm, I'm not too proud to ask for help. Whether I'm asking my friends, you know, my girlfriends, can you help me out today? I can't get to my son. Um, or can you help me out um, with um, just doing drive arounds in the evenings, whatever. Don't be afraid to ask for help, whether it's your colleagues your spouse, your friends, don't be afraid to do that. Don't think it's always that you have to do everything in your career. And I've been fortunate enough that with my spouse in particular, we have a very good conversation around if something's happening, child's sick, we actually have a conversation about what's the best way to manage this. Do we need to get a third party to help us? Can you do it? Can I do it? Those are, that's been absolutely critical in my career to be able to be willing to pull on people to say, use people to help you. Now, in return though, make sure you, you return the favor. So when your girlfriend calls you or your colleague calls you and says, I could use some help today, if you could take that half day vacation and help out, do it for them. So then, then it, it usually has worked very well for me over my life to have that ability to pull on people. But I know I'm the one that usually starts it by starting to say, I need help on this. Could you help me out today? The second one is knowing what you're good at. I firmly believe the reason I've been successful is I actually really love what we do. I am so proud of what our industry does. It's not talked about a lot, but the technology we've employed, the reservoirs that we are producing oil and natural gas out of in the states, the fields that I'm going to go back to work on, 20 years ago we did not even think we could produce out of those. And today we're producing significant quantities of oil and natural gas out of those reservoirs. That's how much has changed just in my lifetime. I, mean, I, I can't believe an engineer to what they're going to be able to do in the next 20 years. The technology advances so much, but you've got to have a passion for what you're doing or you really don't enjoy when you have to make those sacrifices that are out there. Another one, maybe a little bit more to what I've noticed with females I've worked with over the years, don't look for praise. I, I've had a lot of people come to me, am I doing a good job? Can you tell me if I'm doing a good job? I don't have time anymore to tell you all the time you're doing a good job. I'm a very busy person. If, I'm if you're going in the wrong path, I'll tell you. Okay, so assume, assume that it's going well and run with it. I can tell you that a lot of the male colleagues run with it. They run with it. They do the job they've been asked to do. They don't, they're not constantly seeking that feedback. So I encourage you, have confidence in yourself. Don't look for that praise. Look for some direction every now and then if you're confused, but don't necessarily look for that praise all the time. Another one is treating mistakes. Is a, this, is a, this is a big one. When you have, sometimes you're going to have mistakes or failures, and you've got to just, just take that on board and say, I've learned something out of that. And you know, even to this day, at times I'll have employees that'll come to me and say, look, I've made a mistake. I said, well, I appreciate you telling me that, but what I want to know is how you're going to correct that going forward so you don't, you know, don't do it again. That's the most important thing. Use as an opportunity to learn and don't let yourself get pulled down into a spiral. I've made a mistake. I can't recover from this. And the last one, and this one's really important for me, and I use this with my, my children a lot, is make sure, and, I, and this is maybe a turn of phrase to the movie Sliding Doors, I don't know, but there's been some doors that's been opened in my career for me that I thought I did not think that door would ever be a door that I'd walk through. And the classic example was this external affairs role. I'm an engineer. I was working in a commercial space. I had done a really big negotiation with the state of Alaska that encompassed a three-year negotiation. And I was testifying in front of the legislature all the time. And somebody said, hey, you're an engineer that can actually talk. Um, really well with the public, maybe you ought to go into external affairs for a while. And I thought, oh my goodness, that's a, that's a career move I never thought coming. But stepping over out of that comfort zone to go do where I was actually doing media interviews and um, on TV and actually representing our company and explaining what we do in our company actually really turned out to be one of the best career moves I could have ever made. And so it, it was out, really outside my comfort zone, but somebody recognized developing those skills would make me a stronger employee for the company going forward. So being willing to go through that open door and actually test yourself. I'm about to go through another door. This is a really big, different role for me that I'm about to go to. Managing a group of people that are running assets that 20 years ago I didn't even think could produce, I've got a lot to learn. But I'm confident I can go into this role and do it. 
but recognizing just you're willing to have the confidence in yourself to go step over there. So two out of those five are directly related to confidence to get out of your comfort zone. I also believe firmly we've got to do more to encourage women to get into STEM. And I, I, I am pretty passionate about this. I've done a lot of talks to schools in the time that I've been here in Australia. I've enjoyed reaching out because I do not think when young people that are interested in math and science, engineering doesn't pop up first in their mind. Probably missed a slide here, I did. These are all the places I work, by the way, apologies on that. Um, just by the way, I, I do want to go back to that one. That's the North Slope of Alaska. So if you've ever wondered what it looks like to work on the North Slope of Alaska, fully contained facilities, we have to basically build a city when we go up there, when we run our operations up there. And I'm very proud of how our companies have done in such a, a difficult environment and have had a fabulous relationship with the native community of Alaska, some of my best friends from Alaska that I kept in touch with, and currently the Assistant Secretary Head of the Bureau of Indian Affairs in the United States, her and I developed a relationship while working on the North Slope of Alaska. So it's a fantastic operation there. Now back to, to uh, STEM. Um, you know, look, influential mentors, mentors have been absolutely an important part of it for me. Mentors have both been both men and women though. I think that's been important in my career development. I think it is good at times to be able to have somebody that might be going through the same life transitions that you're going through. But for, I also think it's very important to get a perspective from somebody that might be from a diverse background than yourself. So don't just get mentors that are women. I would encourage you, and if you're men, be willing to get out there and mentor and hear their perspective of the challenges that different women are, are facing in their careers, both, both ways. And, and interestingly enough, here in Australia, I'll give share another quick story. One of the gentlemen that worked for me, who happened to be a secondee when I was in the joint venture, I think it took him about two days once to come to me to ask me for some time off to deal with a family situation that they had going on. It, you know, that helped me to understand what made him so nervous about wanting to come and ask for time off. Was it me or the perception of it should be his wife that's taking the time off? So we had a very frank, I said, look, I'm probably one of the few people you can feel really comfortable. If you need and your family situation needs you to work from home for a while to manage this, we will make that happen. I'm just proud that the two of you are having that conversation about who's best placed to take care of what's happening with your family right now. Now, currently my team is addressing how, how do we attract and retain women in our business. Um, and I actually think this is becoming a bigger problem. You know, my daughter and I were talking the other day that the perception of our industry probably isn't where I would like it to be right now. I think our industry has got to do more to talk about what we do and the value we create. I think that's actually affecting our ability to attract young people to want to come into the industry. But I am really, really focused right now. It, well, I'm going to tell the story. Um, one of the ones that I, I feel really fortunate about, I mentioned this earlier, I happen to sometimes when I travel to site, I, I, I can still kind of go incognito if I put my hair in a ponytail and I wear you know, the orange and I've got the hard hat on. You can travel a little incognito every now and then when you're riding the ferry. And I was fortunate enough to hear the story of a gentleman that it was candid to share with me that he was a single father trying to navigate the ferry schedule with his children at home. About two months later, another young lady approached me and said, you know, I'm struggling with the same thing. And that's when they shared that the uh, daycares in Gladstone didn't open up early enough to allow them to drop off and get to the ferry. Now, it took about, these people were probably five, six layers into the organization. So two bold individuals, maybe one didn't know who I was, one of them I'm pretty sure knew who I was, <laughs> um, had, the, had the ability to tell me, this is something you might want to think about. So we implemented a new ferry. We've added a new ferry. We can do that from a cost. It does add some cost. But I think there's a value proposition there. Because I've got people that do want to work eight hours a day. They want to work a full shift. They don't want to go flexible work. They want to work a full shift. We just had to be a little bit creative. How do we navigate the ferry schedule to make that happen? So that's a classic example of ways that I'm hoping to try to change the paradigms around how we work in our industry, but yet be able to attract more people to our industry as a result of that. I'm pat long past the point of needing to be, be convinced. I, when I sit in presentations and people try to tell me there's value in having a diverse and inclusive workforce, I, I've been past that for 20 years. I firmly believe in the value of proposition around diversity and inclusion. But I can honestly say that in the 30 years I've been in the industry, I don't know that we've completely moved the needle. And so I, I know that a lot of people are struggling with that. Where's that silver bullet? I'm not convinced there is a silver bullet. I'm convinced there's a lot of things that are going to have to come together to really move that needle. And we're also challenging a bit because I think the workforce of today is changing too. I think it's more necessary today to have dual careers to make ends meet than maybe it was when I was growing up. So those are the things we're going to have to think through. 
Now this is one that I think is also out there. The stereotype. Um, this is when you Google engineering. So I didn't actually do this. My team did it for me just to prove a point to me. To say, if you Google engineering, this is what you see. And uh, if you, if, yeah, I feel like where all the stock photos came from here, half of them look like models. I, uh, <laughs> you know, but, but if you're somebody that's like 12 years old and you're, try, and you're good in math and science and you Google engineering, or do you see any possibility that you sit in those images? You don't. I don't. I mean, that would not have attracted me to this industry or to go into engineering. So there's definitely things we're going to have to do about how do we deal with the stereotypes of our industry. And I think that's really important. And part of it gets with all of people like you getting out and talking to those students in school today. Because that's where their, their mind is being. By the time they're in year 12, they're probably already decided whether or not they're going to go engineering or they're going to go into the medical field, right? It's probably in those formative years of year 7 through 11 that we need to be engaging a bit more about what our industry does and help get rid of some of those stereotypes. I think there's some fantastic, I, I, uh, there's a headmistress in town that she's a huge fan of engineering and I, I really appreciate she's given me a couple opportunities to talk to students, but we need to actually be engaging with those headmistresses or headmasters and talking to them about what role engineering plays. I, I, don't, I always want to throw, I'm hesitant with throwing out statistics in front of a university, but I, I've, the data I had said that, that uh, female engineering grads still account for a little less than 14% of the engineering grads in Australia. And I remember the data being presented to me that in your Maths B and Maths C classes, it's about equal female and male attendance. So somewhere along the way, we're, either, we're losing a lot of females that are good in math and sciences that are not coming into the engineering fields. So that's definitely something that I think we should be reaching out a bit more to is how do we get those talented math and science students into the engineering profession. I think part of that is we've got to change a little bit about how we promote the disciplines. Engineers, I firmly believe, can change the world and we are shaping, uh, we are really shaping the future. Do you know, mechanical engineering was born out of the Industrial Revolution. Electrical engineering was invented at MIT, and maybe I just had to throw that in there because I'm, you know, <laughs> father of a, or mother of an MIT student right now. Electrical engineering was invented there 100 years ago. And so there's so many things that, and now if I think about what an engineer today, I mean, I'm working with our teams around machine learning and artificial intelligence. The engineer of today is going to be able to accomplish so much more than what I was able to accomplish. I mean, I, I was one of the first engineers in our office that had Lotus 1, 2, 3. And all the engineers that were 50 to 55 to 60, they loved me because I knew how to turn that on, I knew how to use it, I convert the spreadsheets, all the work they had done. The principles of our engineering have not changed in what we do, but the technology and how we can apply it gets stronger and stronger every day. So it's such a fantastic career as far as where it might go. Now, I'm going to quickly just jump ahead here a little bit. Week. Uh, last week, the Shadow Minister for Trade and Resources, Jason Clare, I saw him while I was in Canberra the other day, and we talked a little bit about this. He said his old university, the University of New South Wales, had 120 people enrolled in mining engineering five years ago. Last year, only eight people. So it's back to that perception issue. And I think I heard some similar statistics from UQ uh, the other day that the, the enrollments in, in the resources fields in engineering has deteriorated very much. The reality is working in the resources sector for me has been a very rewarding one and one I would not discourage my children to consider if that's where their passion lies. I firmly believe that as we reshape this resources sector and how we provide energy in a cost-effective and safe and cost-effective manner is something that the brighter brains we bring into it, the more possibility is of where we can actually support this transition in, in, our, in our world. So, in my conclusion, all I really want to ask of you is to promote and support the STEM um, subjects. Get out there and talk about what we do. And getting in there earlier, I think, is a big way to shape that. You provide those examples. The fact, I mean, some of the stories I've shared at the table today, fantastic stories to share with people. Get out there and engage. Sharing stories, in my view, is one of the most powerful and empowering ways for both the listener and the teller. So don't be reluctant. Get out there and get engaged yourself in that process. And thank you very much for your time today.